Today's episode comes to you from Underhill, Vermont, where I interview Paul Chamberlain of Chamberlain's Garden and Farm Market. This episode hits close to home because it is home. This summer, I took a rainy Saturday morning and sat down to interview my grandpa and capture a few of his favorite farm stories and some of the history of our farm. Grandpa and my grandma Joan purchased the property in 1976 and were planning to have a garden and raise their family. Over the years, it slowly grew into quite the farm business, producing sweet corn, pumpkins, hay, strawberries, and a mixed vegetable garden to supply a roadside farm store. Farming for them was a way to have a healthier lifestyle and provide an activity to stay active during retirement after working a full career at IBM. So far, the farmer share has mostly interviewed full-time farmers who grows produce for their career. However, that's not the case for most farm operations. The majority of farm families have off-farm income contributing to the household, which is a fine model as well, and what's worked for our family too. I grew up here on my grandparents' farm, and that's when the bug bit me and hooked my interest in agriculture. The farm has slowed down a little bit in recent years as they've chosen to lean into retirement a little bit more. This year, however, is the first year working through a transition plan where myself and my wife Kylie are managing the business and breathing a little bit of new life into the farm. I'll share more about the future of our farm and where we'd like to take it at another time as plans get more established and the ball gets a little bit more momentum behind it. But today, I hope you enjoy this episode where I interview Grandpa, Paul Chamberlain of Chamberlain's Garden and Farm Market. Yes, this is Paul Chamberlain. Uh, We came to this farm in 1976. Uh, I grew up in Northwest Ohio, son of or grandsons of a farmer. So we lived on the farm all our life till I went to college. And then uh, I came to Vermont in 1970, started to work for IBM. And then after a few years, was looking for a property in the country. And we found this place in 1976. And we fell in love with it right away, even though it was much larger than what I had planned on. And uh, But we started out uh, knowing that I had a job at IBM, that I wasn't really looking at the farm to be my sole source of income, but a good part-time business and also a job that I enjoyed being at outdoors, working on my own. So initially, uh, we came and we started raising uh, dairy heifers. We had a dairy barn. Uh, I didn't want to go into milking. But uh, we would buy calves from a neighbor and uh, raise the calves until we got them artificially inseminated, and we'd sell them when they were ready to freshen. So we did that for about uh, seven years, I guess. And uh, But eventually we stopped doing that because I became allergic to the cows. The dander was affecting my breathing and stuff, so we decided to get rid of them. But while we are doing that, the only other, we had a garden for ourselves, and then we also sold some extra hay. Uh, in about 1982, when we got rid of all the cows, uh, we decided then to start growing some vegetables because we came from Ohio. We had always had vegetables and sweet corn all our lives. So we started growing sweet corn initially and uh, put in a little bit. Uh, and then we started selling it at the roadside in a wheelbarrow with a Crisco can for money. <laughs> and that was the initial start. Well, that was that it, it did well. And then I realized I needed to have a better way to do it. So we uh, built a little 8 by 12 uh, farm stand on skids that we could tow around with a tractor. And we could tow it out to the roadside. And then I could put my corn on a table in the shade and put the can on a table. And that worked good, too. And that allowed more people to see it and more people stopped. And uh, so as it, it went well. And we went through several iterations of how we do corn, but I'll talk about that later. But And after a couple of years of doing that, we had friends who also wanted to have a garden out here because where they lived, they weren't able to have a garden. So we let them put in a garden next to ours. Well, it wasn't long before that lady and my wife, Joan, said, uh, we've got some extra vegetables. Can we put them on the corn stand? And I said, yeah, I don't care. So they put their vegetables out. And, of course, they sold whatever they brought out. And that was fine, except that... Uh, they kept wanting to bring more vegetables. And pretty soon I didn't have enough room for my corn and all their vegetables. 
And so I built wings on the outside of the building to hold more stuff. And we filled it all up. And also at the same time, we realized after we're doing this for a few years that uh, we needed a better place for cleaning vegetables because all we had was a milk room in the barn. We really didn't have a good washroom. And so we built the new Morton building, which we built and put a store in the front of it in 1993 so that we could have a washroom, keep things sanitary and cool. It was cooler. So we did that. And from there on, then we expanded the, the rest of the vegetable growing to, at one point, I think we probably had 20 acres of vegetables because we included a couple acres of pick-your-own strawberries. Uh, we grew uh, an acre of mixed vegetables on black plastic. Uh, we started growing pumpkins. And we even had cut flowers. And we sold honey and syrup and all this stuff. And so we had seasonal workers then for a number of years, probably about 10 years to help us, but it was still a part-time job for us. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the history of how it got going. Uh, now, as far as picking sweet corn, originally we did it, we picked the corn in a wheelbarrow. And sometimes the fields are farther away than you want to push a wheelbarrow to get them up here. So initially we took a trailer mounted on the back of our little Ford 8 end tractor with a ramp. You could run a wheelbarrow up in a ramp <laughs> and then tow it up here. So we were picking corn and putting it in a wheelbarrow, rolling it up a ramp, transferring it down here, and putting it on a stand. Well, that worked for a while, but a wheelbarrow full of corn is heavy, and sometimes it tips over. So that's not really nice. And so we tried to figure out a better way to pick corn. So I had a two-wheel BCS rototiller, which I took the tiller head off and built a stiff hitch, took a Sears lawn cart, put an extended tongue on it, put a seat on front of the box, and it would hitch it to the back of that two-wheeled rototiller, which I could then drive. And I planted my corn so that I had a 30-inch planter with two rows, 30 inches. And then I'd have a 42-inch aisle because my tractor had 72-inch centers on the wheel. So that way I had a 42-inch aisle. I could take a 36-inch lawn cart behind the little rototiller and go up and down the aisles and sit on the trailer and pick the corn or walk behind it and pick and have someone drive the tractor. So that, that worked very well because now we, we had a motorized way. You didn't have to carry it. You could bring it up here and just unload it right on the tables. We did that for many, many years until we realized that driving a two-wheel tractor was a little more difficult. Uh, my wife couldn't do it very well. It had a hand clutch. And so we uh, opted to buy a little nursery tractor. It's a little four-wheel drive diesel articulated tractor. It's only 32 inches wide. And so now we can tow that trailer, same trailer we've always used with that tractor. And my wife or my grandkids, anybody can drive it. And that's how we've proceeded now to harvest our sweet corn. I think at one point we maybe had 10 or 12 acres of sweet corn. Now we raise about seven because once we got to the age where we lost a lot of our workers, our health and our age became a factor. So we've cut way back now. We closed the store about seven years ago. We stopped growing strawberries and we cut back to where we just grew pumpkins and sweet corn at the corn stand. So that's kind of a history of how it got to where it is. So in my model, this was never made to be a sole source of income for us. Uh, I had my IBM job, which helped me able to buy equipment and, and do the things I wanted to do on the farm, enjoy it, and still make some money at it. So that was what we did. Is that enough for now? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a real good summary there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> You weren't relying on it for income, but how much were you taking home from the farm kind of in its, we'll say, heyday? In the heyday, we probably had, we were grossing, our over, our gross would probably be around $100,000 a year. That was for everything, vegetables right. and hay. And I think at one point we figured we were probably netting in our pocket about 40%, roughly. So That's a pretty good uh, was, margin. Yeah, yeah. Right. So even today now with just corn and pumpkins and hay, I still figured my my net was about 50% of our sales. So because I've only done everything retail, a very limited wholesale. I've wholesaled some sweet corn and maybe wholesaled a few pumpkins over the years, but 99% or 95% of it is all retail. So that's another way to keep the profit margin up. Yep. Uh, you said you were doing over 10 acres of corn. Now you're yeah. doing seven. Is that? Just because the demand dropped off when we closed the store? Yeah, right. Yeah. I think the fact that we don't have other stuff here for people to buy 
the, the, every, the corn market is still good, but we just don't have the traffic that we had when we had the whole store open. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned how you, you, you bought this farm not even with the intent to turn it into a, a big business. Right. What was your motivation for wanting to have a house in the country? And Well, we grew up in, in northwest Ohio in a country and on my, next to my grandfather's farm. So as a kid, we always worked in a big garden with my parents, my grandparents. Even in high school, my sister and my brothers and I, at some point one year, we grew a half an acre of cucumbers, which we picked by hand and sold to a pickle factory where they put them in brine and turned them in pickle. So we picked a half an acre of cucumbers <laughs> many, many times and shipped them off to, to do that. So that was one thing we did as children. And also... My parents and grandparents ran a restaurant at the fair back when I was a child, and so we were always growing extra vegetables, which we took to the fairgrounds to use to process into the meals that they sold at the fair. Hmm. So that was so. My background had always been in in farming and doing that. And in high school, I uh, I guess about age twelve or thirteen, I started working for a neighbor who was, happened to be my Sunday school teacher, and that's where I really learned how to drive equipment. My grandfather had an old F-12 farm all, but it, it was 1930s vintage, and we used it a little bit. But when I became a teenager, then worked for my neighbor, I ran, learned how to run bigger farm equipment and combines and drive trucks and and do all the other uh, farm type of work. So I really fell in love with the farming as a teenager. I enjoyed seeing how things grow, you know, how God provides. All we do is plant the seed, and he, he makes the weather, and the soil grows. So I really got a satisfaction out of doing that, even as a teenager, and it never left. So even though when we bought this farm, our intention was to have five or ten acres so I could have a garden for myself, once we got here and we saw we now have, I think, in total now, like 170 acres, of which 100 or more is wooded. But we still have a lot of tillable land. It's relatively flat by Vermont standards, <laughs> and so it was, as it, and it's productive, and so I could farm it. And so that's how we started expanding once we got rid of the dairy and we started going with vegetables. So just have a little garden. <laughs> yeah, just have a little garden. We did. And we still do. <laughs> uh, did you like the animals? Uh, I loved horses. Uh, I did, I, uh, taking care of the animals was okay. I loved the horses, but because of my allergy to them, it's really hard to be close to them and, right. and not have to deal with it. So, and I wasn't unhappy that we got rid of the cows because I realized the cows are 24-7, 365 a day of your project. Whether it's in the summer and you got to keep them in the pasture, whether it's in the winter and you got to keep the water from freezing in the barn, you know. So there's always issues with animals. It's going to take a lot more care. And so uh, that's why I didn't feel too bad when they left. <laughs> <laughs> right. Corn isn't, isn't no, escaping no, no, the no. fence. Right, right. No. And also the fact that I was looking at farming as a part-time enterprise because I had my full-time job, uh, I didn't have to depend on this as my primary source of income. So it made it more enjoyable because it wasn't like if I had a bad year on the farm, we're in serious financial hit. I can absorb that, mm -hmm. you know, where many full-time farmers, that's they depend on it entirely. So uh, that's kind of how it goes. <laughs> what made you decide to go the corporate route as opposed to trying to figure out how to be a full-time farmer? Oh, well, I actually went to school to be trained as a in, as an engineer, and, and I enjoyed working at IBM being in engineering. So I really, I had a science background. I loved doing that sort of stuff. And so that's why I went that way, because I, I realized, too, that farming, you know, uh, for one thing, because of land, it's very difficult for a young guy to get into it, to, to purchase the land or to be able to rent the land and get the equipment to run it. And because I, growing up in a, in a, Midwest, having many relatives with farms, I realized that most of them, their farms were inherited. So they they had the property to work with. They're not indebted to somebody to buy it. And so that's one reason why I, at the young age, I didn't really look at farming as a full-time thing. Do you remember what your parents' farm looked like? Yeah, well, actually, it was my grandparents' farm. He had 40 acres. Uh, his house was on the corner at the two crossroads in the country, and my folks' house was... Just down one road about, I don't know, three, 400 yards, I guess, or 300 feet or so at the other end of the big garden. 
So it was, it's, uh, it was fairly flat, sandy soil, very productive. Uh, you know, my grandfather, even at his age, uh, he rented the farm out. I, I, he didn't really farm it anymore. He rented it to the neighbors who did the farming, and they put in corn and soybeans and wheat and that kind of stuff. So that's what I recall, you know, from being on it. But it was a small farm, not large like they are today. Right. Yeah, 40 acres there. Yeah, right. Northwest Ohio. Yeah. Uh, you, I've, I know you've mentioned the story about you remember filling trucks full of tomatoes. Uh, can you elaborate on okay. that? Yeah, as, a, as in high school, I was, as I said, I was working for my neighbor farming and growing corn, soybeans, and wheat. But he also grew upwards of 100 acres of tomatoes because where we lived, there was, there was a Campbell's Soup Company. There was a Heinz factory. And I think another company within a reasonable distance. So there was at that time, they were growing a lot of uh, fresh vegetables, tomatoes and carrots and peppers, which were harvested by migrant workers. He had migrant workers come from Texas or Mexico every year to harvest the tomatoes. They were then loaded on the trucks and we delivered them to the factories. And so in high school, I, uh, in my senior year, I bought an old 48 Dodge straight truck with an antique then, <laughs> and uh, we modified it, we shortened it, and put a fifth wheel on it, turned it into a tractor, bought a 24-foot trailer, a 10-ton trailer, and made a tractor trailer out of it, and then I could haul 10 tons of tomatoes in uh, boxes, they were boxed and banded on the trailer, to the factory each day, so that, that's what I did for summer to earn my first year's college money was uh, taking Campbell's soup, to, or taking tomatoes to the Campbell's Soup Company. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little project to yeah. modify a truck, make your own <laughs> right, right. tractor trailer, in a sense. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Uh, did you do all the welding and stuff to shorten no, the truck? No, my, my, uh, my Sunday school teacher <laughs> that I worked for, yeah, he was he welded and cut it and mounted a wheel on it. I, set I, you I, up. Just, I, got it, I helped him do it, but he was, he was the guy that put it all together hmm. for me. He told me what we could do. He said, yeah, just get an old truck. We'll modify it and go buy a trailer and put it on. And so what we did was I made my first year's college money hauling that truck or that trailer. And at the end of the season, I sold it to him. Mm -hmm. And he used it for a trailer to haul water or something on after I left. So, huh. What uh, what time was that? that? That was the... Well, I graduated in 64. Okay. So 1964. Early 60s, late 50s yeah, early right. time frame. Yeah. <laughs> I should say also, and besides hauling tomatoes, of course, I worked for my neighbor. He did a lot of harvesting of grain. So we had he had uh, first uh, the self-propelled combines, and you got to realize that the combines we had in the 60s aren't what you see today in modern day. Uh, ours was an open platform. There was no cab. You sat on front of the grain box on an open cab on a seat with a steering wheel, and the grain head was right in front of you. So you could see everything, but you got all the dust and debris from the field. So it was a very dirty job, but those we felt it was great because these were the newest thing. <laughs> and we, we harvested a lot of grain that way. How wide was the head on that? I think it, the header for grain was probably 10 foot, and it probably picked, I don't know if it picked four rows of corn or just two. I can't remember now, but they were very small compared to today's. Hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> Some early equipment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, what do you think your greatest achievement was for farming? Yeah, <laughs> it's a hard one thing. I guess for me, it was uh, the greatest achievement was the personal satisfaction that I got from being able to plant things, watch them grow, and see them harvested. When I go into a field, let's say a field of hay, and I mow a field of hay to work it, and then you eventually you dry the hay and then you rake the hay to bale it. To me, it, it's like being outdoors and looking at the artwork. I see the designs in the field, plus you can look at nature while you're doing it. And it's, to me, it's just the satisfaction I get of seeing that outdoor sort of art in nature. To me, that's yeah. what I see. <laughs> it's true. So it's... That's, that's probably the biggest thing. It's not the financial thing, which is nice, but it's just the self-satisfaction of being in nature and seeing the art design. Especially Vermont is so yeah, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Uh, what was the time that you almost quit, and why didn't you? I almost quit. 
Well, I think the whole issue with our daughter losing losing our daughter that happened before I really got started farming. So mm-hmm. that that's kind of a before issue. Time I almost quit. I don't know if there was a time that I thought that I should give it up. I never did. I don't think I ever saw that. You know, because I was able to keep going, modernize the equipment. Right. You know, the market kept growing, and I think also. I should realize if we started our market here back in the early 80s. And so I saw the potential then because I saw this road. And even though then the traffic was not nearly what it is today, I could see the potential that people are going by here all the time. They're either going up to the mountain or they're going up to Cambridge or someplace. And so I said, there's a lot of traffic goes by here. We have a good location to put in a store or to put in our, our vegetables. Because I figured if people are going to be going by, we might as well give them a reason to stop. And so that was why I thought it was a good idea to start the vegetable stand. And, uh, yeah, so I guess that's, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned it didn't really affect your farming, but the loss of your daughter, how did that affect your life at that time? Well, that happened initially. We had only been in this house on this farm for three weeks when she fell in the brook. And it was severely uh, brain damaged because of loss of oxygen. And so when that happened, and we'd only been here a few weeks, the folks we bought the farm from, they felt terrible also. They were, they were devastated as we were. And they told us at that time that if we wanted to leave, they wouldn't hold us to anything that we had signed legally. Uh, we, were free, we could be free to go. And I said, no, you can't run away from that sort of tragedy because that can happen anywhere. Uh, car accidents happen every time, you know, all the time. And you just can't run away from that. And so we decided to stay. And then after that, that was okay. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that you can't run away from that kind of stuff. Right. I can imagine yeah. though the thoughts running through your brain. You just yeah, well, moved in. Yeah, I know. Like, yeah. What yeah. are we doing here? Yeah. And, uh, so anyway, uh, you mentioned the that the traffic. How how has the marketplace changed or the the customer base changed throughout? Well, our, our, I think our customer base continued to grow until we stop doing the berries and shut down the store. And I think the customer base is still there. Uh, We were never impacted by, I think there's the other farm stands were far enough away. We never felt competition from people up the valley or over Jericho. It was always, we're all each at our own little area of the market. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, uh, uh, but the traffic has gotten, when we came here, you could walk across this road any time of day and not have to look at traffic. Today, I sometimes stand at the road and watch eight or ten cars go by before I get an opening to cross to go to the barn. So that's the difference in the traffic flow. And, so. and uh, another thing I think uh, I should mention, <clears throat> we've always been conventional. I've never gone organic. I did it for a number of reasons. <clears throat> One was uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot more documentation. There's a lot more paperwork. There's some constraints on things I can do or that I couldn't do if I went organic. So we've stayed with conventional. That doesn't mean that we're coating everything with chemicals because I don't use any pesticides as far as spraying for insects and bugs. I do put some herbicide on uh, corn and pumpkins when I plant them, but we're not putting anything on them that's going to affect the crop once it matures. And so that's why I stay conventional. But it's never really impacted our sales. Uh, I tell people if they ask me about it and I say, yeah, I'm conventional, but I don't put any pesticides on the chemical or on the, on the plants. So that's not really been a factor, I think. Uh, did you felt much pressure to do that? To go organic? Yeah. No, never did. No. No, no. no I never felt like yeah. there was a need to. Yeah. Yeah, I work with a lot of organic farmers, mm-hmm. and I'd say a lot more organic than not, honestly. Yeah. Um, in the fruit and vegetable world in the, in the Northeast, which is interesting, but there are definite advantages to not, mm-hmm. not being organic. Yeah, right. Um, for sure. I mean, not, not just chemical use, but some of the materials you can use, like right, the right. bioplastics yeah, or, right. or yeah. the fertilizers just being right. not so stringent right. on right. the, right. on what's available. Yeah, I just use regular mineral based fertilizers, not the organic stuff. Right. Still gets my nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. <laughs> <laughs> the main things that grow the crops. Right. Yep. What do you think has been kind of the key thing to to 
to kept the farm business going? Well, I know because I, I, I'd always planned that when I retired from IBM, I wanted to have something to do. And I loved mm-hmm. farming as much as anything. So I figured at least I'd have this to do after I retired from IBM. And I've been able to do that, you know, since then, because I've been retired over 20 years from IBM. So that's one of the advantages. It gave me a, an after retirement income and after retirement uh, vocation <laughs> yeah. to keep, keep me active. And plus, it is an active thing. You're physically active, doing stuff all the time. And it's outdoors a lot, which is good. Do you think the physical aspect has been uh, beneficial, or do you think it's worn you worn you no, out? <laughs> I think it's been beneficial. I'm sure I would have been in a lot worse physical shape if I hadn't done it in all these years. Right. You know, I know our bodies eventually wear out, and I feel some effects of that, but I still think it's the better thing to do. What was, this is, some of these questions are, uh-huh. are from Mark and Krista okay. after I interviewed them. <laughs> yeah. I asked, what would, what would you ask, Grandpa? Okay. <laughs> um, so what was easy then versus, what was, yeah, what was easy or hard, we'll say back then, and is now, what's easy or hard now? Well, I think when we came here, uh, doing the hay was harder then than it is now. When we came here, we started out with a Ford 8 end tractor and a 7-foot sickle bar mower, an old side delivery rake, a tow-behind hay conditioner, and a baler with an engine on it. <laughs> and I had that just that one tractor. And so all the hay, you had to mow with that little Ford, and it will mow hay, but with a sickle bar, it can get bound up, and you have to, you have to go back up. And the Ford did not have a live clutch, so you had to shut off that every time you push the clutch in. So it was diff- relatively difficult with that. Uh, then uh, also then putting up the hay meant that we were doing it with a baler with an engine. So we had to load all the hay by hand, come out of chute, <laughs> you know, had to load it all by hand on a wagon. And then the dairy barn we had was a hundred year plus old dairy barn. And it was very uh, inconvenient as far as getting hay in the loft because you couldn't drive through the barn. You had to back a wagon in, run an elevator up in the loft. And it was not good circulation for air, so it was hot. And it was just, it was a hard deal handling hay in that situation. Whereas now with our new, once we put up the Morton building, we can store hay inside. You can drive through one side to the other. We got the new baler with a kicker. We got wagons with racks. You know, I got the new type of mower with discs, which never plugged. And so it's much easier doing more hay than it was back then doing less hay. Hmm. (laughs) So to me, that was... One thing that was harder and I got easier now. What's harder today than you know, it was easier yeah, then. Uh, going back to hay for oh, a second. Okay. Um, now, on on a good day, we could do, we pretty easily do five acres of hay and yeah. bring in three, four hundred bales in a day, like yeah. without too much effort. How much were you doing when you started in a day? Oh. I don't know. It's hard to say. Maybe yeah. a couple hundred, but when you say it's 350, 400, I should <laughs> let you know that there have been times when I've done a thousand bales a right. day by myself. <laughs> I have six wagons, and if I even throw them in loose, you can put 150 on a load. You can get almost a thousand bales on six wagons and not have to have anybody else handling them until you unload them. So, yeah, a good day would be 500 or 700 bales, but you can do more if you have the weather and right. the time. So, uh, so hey, and relative easy. Uh, still trying to think what's harder today and what. Hmm. Oh, one thing that would be harder today. It's not harder today, today, but it's harder as we got near the end of our time having the store open was labor. Uh, when we started the vegetables and we had a neighbor who wanted to have a garden with us, she became one of our employees. Then we have another neighbor who became an employee, and these were both people of our age group. And so they were; those two ladies were excellent workers. They both loved gardening, and so it was easy labor-wise. They knew how to weed. They knew how to harvest. They knew how to clean. You know, it was very easy. And over the years, we would hire other either high school or college-age students, young people, to help. Some of them were very good. Some had no idea <laughs> what was expected or what to do. So it was it got more difficult with labor. And then, of course, uh, as the young people got to college age or high school age, 
school would start in August or September, right at the peak of our harvest. <laughs> so it, it got to be more difficult as we couldn't get young help and the other people aged out. It got the, the labor became a real issue. And then of course, as, as with our ages and my wife's age and health, you know, with arthritis and other factors, it just became more difficult to do it. Yeah. That's probably why. Those, those key employees, were they, were they great? Cause they had ownership as well. Like they felt they knew what to do and they wanted yeah. to do it. Yeah. yeah. And they wanted to do it and they, I didn't have to spend a lot of time with them. They knew how to do stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, they knew how to weed. Uh, so yeah, we, I always think back, we had one young, uh, one person who uh, high school student, I guess he was worked for us a couple summers and uh, weeding strawberries. Now we grew matted rose uh, strawberries for two acres. They were not on plastic. Uh, we had overhead uh, sp- uh, irrigation sprinklers and weeding. Uh, other than once the aisles got too narrow to drive a tractor, we had to weed by hand. And I remember this one young fellow, uh, it was getting near uh, lunchtime. And one of the ladies said to him, uh, you're not getting all the weeds out. You got to pull them. He said, oh, you have to take out all the weeds. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, because if you don't, they're bigger next time. So, you know, it's just that perspective that the young person didn't realize what you had to do. Or the fact that lunchtime's coming, but we're not quite done, and they wanted to quit. And it's like, well, let's just finish this, and then we're done. So, you know, younger people have a different viewpoint on some of that stuff or lack of understanding of what was needed. So it just made it a little difficult. So were they just pulling the big weeds? Yeah, yeah. generally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the more of the big ones, not right. getting all the yeah, little ones. Right. So, yeah. so, so it's, it's just a difference in... But yeah, some, some young people are very good at it, but some are not. And, and I think at that age, they don't know either what they enjoy doing. So I can't blame them for the fact that they just don't understand it. <laughs> yeah. They, they don't know what they don't know. Yeah, right. So <laughs> yeah. was it, was it difficult to train these young people or not? No, not typically. No. I mean, they were, they were good at, you know, learning. I mean, yeah. we showed them what we needed to have done and, and we all did it with them. So it wasn't like we just showed them here to do this and we went away. Right. So my wife and the other ladies and I would be out there weeding with them so they could see what we're doing. So it worked well. But uh, like I said, the two other ladies, uh, one moved away, one aged out. And then as we got older, it got harder. And so plus back when we were growing flowers, uh, one of the ladies was very good at making floral arrangements to put in the store. You know, I knew nothing about flowers, but we got some lady who just knew how to make a bouquet that was very attractive. And so those kind of things are nice to have. Yeah. yeah. How did you, how did you find the, the young labor? Is it just people who asked, are you hiring or did you reach out to people? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Well, a lot of them were, I think were acquaintances. I know mm-hmm. I think back a lot of the young ladies, especially work for us, were either Folks, parents we knew from church or neighbors, you know, and they grew up around here. And so I think a lot of them are that way. There may be a, a few who called or come by and wanted to know about work and we might hire them. But I think a lot of it was just local people that knew us and the kids decided to try it. Yeah. Uh, just circling back, I didn't know if you could mm-hmm. think of something that is hard now that was maybe easier when you started. Well, I think just because physically I'm not near as strong mm-hmm. now. Uh, physically doing doing uh, labor that requires more strength, whether it's lifting heavy objects or loading like fertilizer in the bins up high, you know, stuff like that. Uh, my back and legs are not as strong as they were. And so it's, it's harder physically to do some of those things. I'm not as coordinated as I used to be and not as, not as sturdy and not as stable. So balance is an issue. And as you get older, you're more aware of the implications if you fall. So you tend to be more cautious. So I think that's one of the things that's harder for me now is not being able to physically just say, well, just, I'll just do that. So that's why I often ask, Andy, can you help <laughs> me do this? <laughs> uh, are there other uh, things that maybe you've implemented or modified as you're not quite as strong as you used to be? It's kind of been evolving, so it's hard to think. Yeah, it is, it is, I know. It's like yeah, getting new, getting the newer tractor. Well, I know all that, but I, I also think when you're doing hay, one of the things you learn, even as a younger person, that you learn when you're doing a lot of hay, handling the small hay bales, 40, 40, 50 pound bales, 
is you learn how to move them with the least amount of energy. I mean, it's one thing to pick up a bale from the ground and try to throw it onto a pile or into a wagon or on the ground versus learning how to use your leg, pick up the bale, put it against your leg, and use your leg to help push it. You learn all these tricks. Of how can I do this with a minimum amount of energy and not strain my back? And so, so those are things that I've learned over time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good it's a good thought because it's always when we have somebody new helping us on yeah, heyday. It's right. like, oh boy, no, you're <laughs> you're doing it wrong. <laughs> well, they, well, they they just understand. They just how do I? How, they don't know what to do with it. Right. Know? So it's never moved them, and it's a technique that you learn over time. Uh, what's one of your best memories from the first ten years of farming? <laughs> okay, here's a good one for you. One well, of the memories I don't remember if it was ten years, the first ten years or not, but. Uh, some point back in the eighties, uh, my wife's sister in Ohio had a horse and the horse had a cold. And then my sister or my wife's sister was going off to college. She wasn't going to be able to keep the horse anymore. She wanted to know if we could bring it to Vermont now, cause we have a farm. <laughs> well, first, oh, I don't know. We thought about it. Well, it turns out the neighbor we bought the horse, the farm from was an old horseman. He had horses his whole life, work horses. So he agreed to go with us to Ohio. We rented a trailer, went to Ohio, and brought this horse back. And it was a very nice horse, Arabian young horse. And so we had him along with an older uh, horse that my wife could ride. And back in that time frame, uh, we were also still had, this must have been the early 80s because we still had the cows. And we had a, a black Angus that we were raising for beef. His name was Charlie. And he was in, in the barn. He was always kind of wild, kind of a gnarly he wasn't tame. He wasn't easy to deal with. So uh, we were putting him out in the summer to put him out in the pasture, and we had him in the barnyard, and he broke through the electric fence. And he took off running, and we chased him, and we couldn't catch him. He ran through the field, across the river, up the hay field on the other side. We were at a loss. How are we going to get him back? Well, we didn't know. And we could see him up there, but you couldn't get close to him. And so my neighbor, Mr. Pollard, said, uh, well, why don't we go have a roundup? I said, really? Oh, yeah. Well, get the neighbor kids. The Sullivan's next door. They got horses, and the kids are, you know, young too. So we got our two horses, and I guess they had a couple. I can't remember, and got them. And Wayne went with us, and we went across the river and uh, saw him, the, ho the cow laying up along the fence row and we snuck up the hill so he couldn't see us till we got fairly close. And once he saw us, he took off running, and so we chased him with four horses. And uh, it was like a rodeo roundup. <laughs> so we chased this cow, and actually we got him between two horses, and we're running him. He's running, and we're running alongside, and we actually ran him till he dropped. So we ran him till he ran out of air, and he went down. And so as he went down, then Mr. Pollard jumped on him and held his head down so he couldn't get up until we put a rope around his neck. And then we hitched him to the back of the tractor and towed him back to the barn. <laughs> so to me, that was one of my memories that I really enjoyed thinking about. A high adrenaline day. A, a roundup. <laughs> How long does it take to tire an Angus cow? Uh, well, he, it's probably not too long because we were running him up a hill. Okay. It was across the river going up the hay field. So yeah. running uphill. Some steep hills. I didn't know if that was a, a few minute no, adventure was, or yeah, all just, afternoon was, event. No, no, it was just a few minutes. Yeah. So so that was a kind of a memory I've always recalled, <laughs> the roundup. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, what was uh, what was Wayne's involvement uh, after after you bought the farm? Well, when we first came here, Wayne was ecstatic that we were coming here because a number of reasons. One was they never had any children, and the second of all. Uh, we had our two older boys, uh, Terry and Tim, when we came here. They were like 11 and 8. And so he saw them as, oh, man, little little guys I can be around. So he loved our kids. And so he would help me. He he was it was invaluable to help me learn all the techniques, how to use the equipment that he gave me when we came. And also he was always willing to help me, whether it was haying or moving cows or whatever. So he – and he enjoyed it. He, he, st he was still healthy enough he could do stuff and – and he, he liked doing that, so he was a big help. I learned a lot from him, and uh, I was really glad to get to know him. Now, it's interesting that uh, I have a grand, I had a grandparent. My grandparents lived in Ohio, and when we bought a farm here, my grandfather, who at the time was probably 80 years old, he was ecstatic to think that one of his grandchildren bought a farm. 
Hmm. And so he and my grandmother actually traveled up here to visit us one year. And my grandfather actually got on a wagon and buck bales <laughs> at 80 years old. He was so excited to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he and Wayne Pollard then became best buddies. Mm -hmm. And, of course, both of them, my grandfather and Wayne, were horsemen from that generation. And so they talked all the stuff about what they did when they were young with horses. And they became great friends. And eventually, Wayne and Edna went back to visit my grandparents in Ohio a couple of times. Hmm. So that was kind of a neat, neat thing that happened with him. <laughs> but he was a big help. What type of farming did was Wayne doing before you came? Oh, Wayne was a dairy farmer. He had sold his, his herd probably just uh, two or three years before we came here. Yeah, he, he was born and raised. I think he was born here in Underhill, just up the valley here a little ways. And he was, and he grew up here and farmed. His parents owned it before he did. And he was a dairy farmer all his life. Had his work horses. He loved, he did all his, majority of his farming with horses. He had a Ford tractor and he had a farm all age, but he, he mowed hay with horses. He raked with horses. He bailed with that engine baler behind the two wheel gig with horses, picked up the bales on a wagon with horses. So he loved his, his bells and work horses. And he also used them for logging because we had a lot of woods here. He, uh, I don't think, I don't recall him logging to sell logs, but he logged for firewood. Mm -hmm. And I, I went up several times with him to bring down logs out of the woods to turn into firewood. So he was great at doing that. <laughs> Did he have a certain resistance to having uh, newer technology, or he just he just really loved playing with his horses? No, he loved horses. Yeah. Uh, he he loved horses so much. He 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 knew how to train horses. Uh, as a young person, I heard him tell a story about when they had a colt one time when he was young. He would bring the colt in the house. Oh, jeez. He, he brought the colt in the house, you know. And so <laughs> you know, his mom probably didn't care for it. But <laughs> anyways, he he loved to train work horses. He loved to go to fairs and watch the work ho the train and watch the horse shows and horse pulling. And he also knew his cows. Uh, he was a great dairy farmer because he knew his cows. He loved them. And we could go to an auction and he could tell you what was good or bad about every cow that came out to be sold huh. just by looking at the cow, the shape of the back, the way their udder hang. He, he could, how they walked. He could tell you, he, he knew his animals and he, he just loved them. So he farmed, he dairy farmed all his life till I think 73 is when he sold mm -hmm. the herd. So huh. yeah. that's so interesting. And like, he's, <laughs> that's a lost art yeah. in today's day. Uh, maybe some dairy, <laughs> some, some do, some, I'm some sure. Some dairy good. <laughs> The, yeah. the, the number of people that can look at an animal yeah. and know them is <laughs> yeah. is going yeah. down. Yeah. Uh, what's what's a exciting memory or farm story in in the last ten years? Kind of post retirement, last twenty years, we'll say. Post retirement, I guess it may be even more than ten years, but it's it's continued to grow. So I'll bring it up. It's the corn roast that we have here every year. Uh, we started a corn roast probably back in the late seventies. We were in a Bible study group with folks from our church and they came out one summer and we went back by the river and built a campfire and we had some corn. So we threw it in there and roasted it and everybody thought that was fun. We should invite the church next year. And so we did. So the next year, maybe we had 15 people and we did the same thing. Well, as time went on and the church grew and more and more people became involved, uh, we changed how we cook corn because the fire got too big and we had too many people. So we eventually moved the cooking on charcoal by several different versions. And uh, so t now uh, the corn roast turned into an outreach in that we are now, we open it up to invite our neighbors and friends from church or our, our neighbors here in the community to come out and enjoy an evening of sweet corn, hay rides, whatever. And I just, uh, to me, it's the best day of the year because I see so many people enjoying the farm. Mm -hmm. They can come out and they can enjoy the scenery, enjoy the corn, enjoy the seeing the river, hay rides, whatever. So that's probably the best memory I get is every year. Uh, and we have, and it's all organized, so it's not too much work for us. We just show them which field to pick and they bring in the corn. So I guess that's the best memory. Yeah, no, that's a, <laughs> that's a good one. That's probably one of mine. Growing up too, because like you said, it's every it's been every year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something that's been ongoing, <laughs> uh, a staple. Yeah. What do you think that the impact of that event has had on the church community? 
Well, I think it's it's uh, given a lot of people, uh, people who may are going through struggles to come out and just have an enjoyable day outdoors with friends and family. Uh, I know that's been a lot to people, and some people eventually get connected to the church through the cornrows, which is great. So I don't, I don't know if I really know all the impact. I just, I hear a few stories, so that's what I know. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, uh, people seem to like it because they keep asking to if we're having it again and and when it is. So <laughs> you can I can tell people about a year ago. Andy came and asked me if we could. Uh, we needed we needed to put cover crops in where the sweet corn's been. It's been there. We haven't we haven't we've rotated corn and pumpkins, but we haven't really taken it out of production. So we took the whole field out of production for a year, seven acres, put cover crops in it, and whatnot, and then. Uh, so that year we had cover crops growing. We moved the cornfields to other areas. Well, the community became very anxious. I, I guess that's the best way to put it. Uh, people called. People stopped by. Uh, everywhere I went, people asked me, you're not growing corn this year? Uh, no, we are. You just can't see it. Well, they, they were so worried that they would not be sweet corn. And so this year, the cornfield is back where it was, most of it. And I already have so many comments from people. Oh, I can see the corn's growing. <laughs> we're all good now. <laughs> so it's a, it's a deal. Yeah, lesson learned last year. That's right. Because, yeah, so many people were panicking, uh, were. panicking. So we learned, okay, we at least have to have some corn right next to the road because putting it out of sight is not acceptable for our community. They were yeah. they were thinking the farm's going under. And like, no, no, we yeah. still got corn. What did you envision your farm would look like when you started? Did you have an idea of what you wanted it to be? Well, I knew when we started, uh, even though we were raising young stock, that I didn't. I never wanted to go into dairy. I came to the Midwest, and I saw what dairying is like here, in, at least in Vermont, New England. The fact that you have a short growing season, you have a long, cold winter, you have high energy costs. To me, that was just never the way I wanted to go. So I, I raised young stock, and that was okay. Uh, I guess I envisioned it because I came from the Midwest doing more of the, of the cropping like I do now with corn, pumpkins, even though it's not field corn, it's sweet corn, and then hay because we have a lot of ground we can do hay on. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's it's kind of turned out like I wanted. <laughs> yeah, it just kind of evolved and you it rolled did, with it because it, right. it was always – the hobby. It was something right. to do. Right. You, yeah. you didn't. Right. It's not like you were set out to to turn no. it into something. I didn't come here with a business plan. <laughs> yeah. I didn't come here with a. Here are my risk and here's my you know inputs and ex, you know, I didn't I didn't come with that. You know I wasn't looking at it that way. It was it was something to do and something I like to do. So I did it. Yeah. yeah. Was that difficult when you were trying to buy the farm because you didn't have a business plan? No. No. It was never a factor because I wasn't looking at it to grow as a right as a business, you know. That's something that has certainly evolved in the last fifty years because yeah, yeah. just uh, finding a piece of land of a couple hundred acres and yeah. going to buy that would is not <laughs> not so <laughs> straightforward. No. Uh, what's the next? A uh, decade of farming look like for you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If I'll, I don't know if I'll be here another decade <laughs> for farming. For no, I think my farm days are are getting shorter. You know, I mean, uh, I realize you know I don't have as many years left to do it as I did when I started, and so I do. We like to travel. You know, we like to uh, do other things. Like I can't deal with the cold weather the way I used to when I'm younger. So I don't enjoy being here all winter. So I, I don't see farming is not going to be as as impactful as it had been. You know, but that's okay. I've had a good run at it. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did mostly what I wanted to do with it, and uh, and uh, just glad to, that I could. You said mostly what you want to do. Are there things that you wish you had done or were able to do and you didn't on the farm? Yeah. No, not really. I did mostly what I wanted to do. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything that I wished I had done that I didn't do. 
I mean, we built a new Morton building, which I, we really needed because the old <laughs> barn was dilapidated, and that's been an excellent thing, and it's worked out well, and I've been able to evolve the equipment, so it made things easier for us. And I also, I've also enjoyed farming because it was a, a part-time and not full-time. And the fact that for me, it was, now that there's no animals, it's mainly a May to October. So it's roughly six months of activity. And then I, the rest is just okay. <laughs> the time off. So, yeah. Is there, you, um, is there something not part of the farm, but it just in life that you wished you were able to do? Well, I think I'd like to travel more. Mm. We have been able to, to visit friends and family in India and friends in Africa. And, uh, you know, I've been to Europe a few times back when I worked for IBM, but I would like to travel more and you know, enjoy seeing other parts of the world, seeing different cultures, seeing different, you know, climates and everything. So it's. Yeah, yeah. You've, you've had the opportunity yeah, to kind of see some real interesting yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. What advice would you give to your your beginning farmer self? You give it to me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like if somebody were to you were you were thirty, you just moved to the farm. If knowing what you know now, what would you have told yourself then? Like, make sure you. Yeah. Well, I think if I told a young farmer is. Make sure you realize it takes time. Don't expect to have everything uh, the way you want it right away or to have everything that you can do done the way you want it. Uh, it just takes time, time for financially. It takes time for you physically. It takes time for a lot of reasons for things to get to where they are. So, you know, everybody looks now and say, wow, that's a really nice farm. I say, yeah, but I've been here over 40 years. So it's not like... <laughs> When I came here, I, I didn't really have an idea that it would be like it is now, but I'm happy with it the way it has come out. And I think we just, we moved, as the opportunities came, we moved with it and uh, didn't really, I didn't really, I don't believe I put extra pressure on to say, I'm going to do this regardless. Mm -hmm. I never felt that way about it. I just uh, did what I could and uh, see what happened. <laughs> Uh, what, so that is kind of one part, what advice would you give to a new farmer starting now? Would that be different? Well, it's hard to say because I can only look at the farm in this particular instance. Yeah. And I saw so there's a lot of different kinds of farms. So I'm not really sure, you know, like right now, like when we started, there were not that many vegetable growers around. So it was relatively easy. We didn't have competition amongst them. Uh, the organics was not a thing that was even talked about back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, today it is a lot. And so I think that creates more competition amongst farmers for market. And uh, that would be the thing is to try to determine what your market is or where you can get into the market and make it profitable without struggling just to, to keep going. Because I think a lot, I think that's why people are finding out that even with dairying, you know, people have been in dairying for generations, but now they're finding out it's just not sustainable in the long term the way it has been. And so, and that's been the history of Vermont. If you look back at Vermont, when after the Revolutionary War and the first land grant people came here, uh, they started out, they didn't have what it is today. Vermont was like 80% wooded. So they had to spend a lot of effort and time clearing to get fields that could produce grass or, or crops. And eventually, over time, you know, it became a breadbasket for New England. And so the early market was, even when Wayne was here back in the early the part of the 20th century, they were growing um, grain, uh, you know, in larger quantities than they are today. And that's eventually, so they were shipping grain to Boston for the flour and all this stuff. But then when the railroads came and people moved west, you know, then it went to uh, went to sheep. And eventually the wool industry died out and it went uh, downhill, and then it turned to dairy. And so you can see over the generations, it's, it's modified, it's changed. So but I don't know what the future is here for farming, whether, yeah, <laughs> what it'll be. 
Yeah, because <laughs> dairy's on the decline. So yeah. kind of what's next, yeah. you know, for yeah. Yeah, for the vast majority right, of the right, working right. landscape. Yeah. yeah. A lot of uh, n- young, new, beginning farmers listen to my podcast and they're either thinking about kids or re- have young children. <laughs> Do you have any advice on kind of farming with youngins? Well, I think having grown up on a farm as a youngin, I think it was great. And I think our kids growing up here on a farm had an experience that the majority of kids in town never get. So for me, it, it's, it's a wonderful place to raise kids, not just to get farm help out of them, <laughs> but the fact that they learn so many trades, whether it was mechanical, how to fix things, how to run things, how to drive things, you know, how to use things, that's how to use tools. So I think it's a great experience to grow up on a farm and be able to learn all those things that you would never learn being in the city, you know. So right. I think it's a great place for kids. Say you had another 50 years left of life. Yeah. What do you think you would do with the farm for the next <laughs> period of time? <laughs> or I guess, do you think you would do anything different than what? It kind of has been mm-hmm. and is. Well, one thing, and I'm not sure, in my own mind, I think because of the way the country's gone economically, in Vermont maybe in particular, as I see, yes, there's, there are different, inf- the economy of the, con- of the state is changing. Uh, we don't have near as much agriculture, I don't think, as we used to have. We don't. But also, because of that, I, I see like, in our own, we sell a lot of hay for horses. But over the years, I've seen a lot of our friends who've had horses either, oh, I've only got one horse now this year, or, oh, I sold my horses, oh, we're moving to Colorado. Yeah. You know, so over the years, I've had many, many, you know, people that we've dealt with who decided to leave. So that's one thing I, you know, say there's still a market for hay, which is fine. But in the long term, I'm not sure what would supplement that or, Mm-hmm. replace that in terms of using this sort of land. Now, uh, maybe if somebody was going to farm it on a different scale, and instead of just doing retail, do wholesale, maybe there'd be a larger market than to, if they wanted to, to uh, move other things, other commodities. Right. And I'm not sure what they might be, but because I'm not sure where the profit margin would be on those. But uh, that's just a thought. What have you noticed from the change of climate over the last 50 years of being here? Well, in general, and and at least on my farm, I think it's been drier. Like right now we're getting rain. Well, it's been (laughs) dry. But historically, when we first came here, I remember down uh, between here and the river, there's a ditch that used to have water flowing through it. And then over years, uh, now there's nothing. It's just a depression in the ground. The groundwater is not there anymore. And I know we've had when we had shallow wells over here, uh, there was a problem with uh, not getting enough water out of the shallow wells. And so even though we get rain and we sometimes get floods, uh, I don't. I just remember it seemed like it used to be wetter, longer, or more than it was now. Mm. Uh, so. I think it's hotter. You know, maybe it's maybe it's hotter. It's hard to say because sometimes we still get cold, wet weather. Right. And it's and we don't live long enough to see some of the overall changes. So I don't know, but I think relatively it hasn't changed a lot here. Like we hear about the extremes going on in other parts of America mm-hmm. with drought or fires or floods, and we haven't seen that now. The last major flood here was in twenty seven. So it's been 100 years, so maybe we're due. I don't know. But, <laughs> but anyways, uh, and we've had hurricanes, which flooded. But uh, I don't know. It seems to me like we've never had an issue. Of course, this is river bottom ground, so it's sandy and gravelly and light. So it drains quick. So typically after a day or so of rain, you can go and plow. But, uh, but I think it seems to be pretty dry relative to maybe what I remembered 30, 40 years ago. Right. <laughs> yeah, that that ditch over by the burn pile. Yeah. It's no, I've never, I've really never seen water in no, that. I know, I know. Yeah. yeah. You learned a lot about how to farm from, from Wayne, the neighbor who you bought yeah. the farm yeah. from. 
are there other sources of of resources that you learned? Well, mostly I think mostly I learned it as a kid in Ohio. Mm. Because when we bought this farm and I was working at IBM, everybody there said, you did what? <laughs> you bought a farm? Uh, how do you know what to do? Because most people don't have any idea. And they didn't know that I grew up in Ohio and that I grew up in a farm community. And so tractors were nothing new to me, you know, trucks and equipment and, right. and, and tilling the ground. How do you turn the ground? How do you make the ground so you can grow stuff in it? you know, all these things. So I didn't have an issue with it. And so I think most of it I learned before I, before I went to IBM. Just, just your upbringing. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Which is another good reason to have a kid grow up on a farm. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. To teach them. Sure. They teach all these things. And all they, these things. Yeah. yeah. I know when Wayne and Edna were alive, and they told us about living through the Depression back in the 30s. And he said, yeah, and during the Depression, you know, he said, people were out of work. You know, it was really a bad time. He said, we never went hungry. Hmm. And they had a farm. They ate eggs and chickens. They had meat. You know, they had milk. They, you know, they could survive even in a hard economic time. So that's a good thing to know. Right. <laughs> yeah. To say, what happens now if your food supply goes bonkers like sometimes it does in one commodity whether right. it's lettuce or something but what happens if it you know the major things are not there well who's going to be able to survive is going to be the guy that knows how to grow it and i also am, one of the things i always concerned about is is uh is availability of seeds mm -hmm. what happens if all of a sudden our seed supplies dry up because then even the farmers are hurt now historically farmers used to save grain in the fall to plant in the spring Right. Well, nobody does that anymore. They buy the grain, they buy the seed every year. And so that depends on somebody else providing the seed. So that's another risk. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> so Yeah, it's it's so big of an industry right, now. We right, don't right, think much about right, it. But right. yeah. Well, what happens if there's a supply issue and all of a sudden you can, or the, the boats don't go and they can't get the stuff shipped? And uh, so where are the seeds coming from? You know, now, I know we grow some seeds in this country, but I know a lot of seeds are commercial produce overseas right and then a shift here so <laughs> so i think it's a good reason to grow up on a farm at least you know how to provide your food what was a time where you felt really challenged by farming <laughs> i guess uh, if i think way back when we had the animals when we were raising the dairy heifers in the barn we had up to 50 at a time and uh the winter it was a winter in the 80s when we got extremely cold, we had, I think, a month where it never got to 32. We had 10 days where it never got above zero. And, of course, the water froze in the barn. And so we had to carry water by hand from the house to the barn to feed all those animals. And I really felt challenged because it's like, man, I don't know if I can just keep doing this. And this is going to happen every year, you know. <laughs> And so that was one of the time I really felt challenged was when it got extremely cold and we were just trying to keep things from freezing in the house. Right. Right. Let alone and keep the animals. So that was, that was tough. What does sustainable farming mean to you? I guess it just means farming that you can continue to do in a manner that's uh, not just profitable, but it's, uh, it's, uh, environmentally safe and it's enjoyable and uh, and it provides for the community and something that can continue after you're done doing it because somebody else can take it over and continue to keep it going yeah well that was all i had is yeah. are there any other farm stories that uh hmm. you wanted to share i probably forgot most of the good ones then. <laughs> as you get older you think back all the things you know, until something perks your mind and you, one comes to mind, but it's hard to think. Yeah, they always come up when we're, when when we're out doing right, something. Yeah. yeah, that's the way it goes. Um, I remember one winter <clears throat> when Wayne and Edna were still here and Wayne had his horses. Uh, he belonged to the, I can't was called Green Mountain Draft Horse Association or something like that. And in the winter, when there was snow, they came here to the farm while a lot of his friends with their horses and their teams and they're sleighs and sleds, hmm. and they were taking kids for rides up and around the fields here in the, 
you know, with the workhorses. So I remember, because I got a few old pictures of some of the young people getting to go for a sleigh ride or sled ride behind the workhorses. And they did that just to help to entertain the kids. So I remember that was that was a neat thing to see. Huh. That you don't see anymore. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> sled or sleigh rides is right, not right. very common. No. Uh, you mentioned the other day how uh, you had received the land records for oh, yeah. this parcel. Yeah. And you mentioned how you've owned it as long as almost right. anybody. Right. I got, as a matter of fact, I got this stuff out for Andy so I could let him look at it. But anyways, it said that uh, the original landowners, uh, the original deed that they could trace back in our town came to us, came to this land back in 1817. That was the first wow. record that they have of it. Some fellow named John Maddox. And anyway, so that's just a list of the owners and when they owned it and from 1817 till now. And I went through and looked at this, and I looked at all the names and how long people were here. And I realized that we have owned this property now longer than any previous tenant. Uh, we've been here 40-plus years. So it's interesting to see that some people came and stayed for a while. Some people were only here a couple of years. I don't know all the circumstances back then, what happened, but, yeah, it was just uh, interesting to see and uh, to wonder what this place looked like back then. Yeah. Of course, in 1817, this house wasn't here yet. They think that they well, they told us this house was built in 1835, so that was 20 years after the first guy owned it. So obviously, when they came, it had to have been forested, I would think. Yeah. And somebody had to start clearing it. And what they did then, it's hard to say. But. Yeah. <laughs> I see the old stone walls and yes, right. fence lines, and of course yeah. the the barbed wire in the trees was yeah. back just just <laughs> Wayne's time frame. So yeah, right. Just, I, I'm wonder. I'm always yeah. curious too. Yeah, what it? Yeah. What did it look like a hundred years ago? Yeah, all right. Yeah. Probably wouldn't even hardly recognize it. No. And the fact that there was no electricity. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, we we just take that for granted. But it wasn't until I think the 30s, 1930s or so, before they got any electricity. And so up until then, it was all oil lamps and candles. And well, heck, your house didn't even hardly have insulation when you no, bought it. No, so no. most of them didn't. Awesome. Well, this was fun, and um, I'm glad I got to capture some of those farm okay. stories. So thanks for thanks for being on the show. You're welcome. <laughs> Have fun with it. Yeah. I'm Andy Chamberlain, and that was the Farmer Share. I hope you enjoyed this episode with my grandpa, Paul Chamberlain of Chamberlain's Garden and Farm Market. This podcast has a YouTube channel with videos from several of the farm visits. We're also on Instagram, so that's where you can be reminded about the latest episode or see the photos from the visit. You can go to thefarmersshare.com to listen to the previous interviews or see photos, videos, or links discussed from the conversations. If you don't want to miss the next episode, enter your email address on our website and you'll get a note in your inbox when the next one comes out. If you are enjoying the show, I'd love it if you could write a review. In Apple Podcasts, just click on the show, scroll down to the bottom, and there you can leave five stars and a comment to help encourage new listeners to tune in. I'd also encourage you to share this episode with other farmer friends or employees or family who you'd think would be inspired by listening to the show. The Farmer's Share is supported by the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Association and the Ag Engineering Program of the University of Vermont Extension. If you enjoy the show and want to support its programming, you can make a donation on our website by visiting thefarmersshare.com support. Thanks for listening.